Okay, we're going to begin. Tonight's topic I called Forbidden Fruits. And I will explain soon what I mean by that. This is a very sensitive topic. Unfortunately, there's a need to speak about it. And I hesitated if I should give a whole lecture about this. Since it's not easy for many people to hear what the Torah has to say about it, what tradition has to say, nonetheless, it's important that those who have a need for guidance in life, that they should be able to get the information, whatever information is available to them, in whatever area they have a need. Unfortunately, this topic has not been addressed enough. Even though there's a lot of material, a lot of articles written about it, I don't think they have done enough justice to it. But I do want to say, as an introduction, what I said in another lecture, that whoever does not have faith in God, whoever does not believe that life has a purpose, you will have it more difficult accepting what is going to be said. After all, we all have our own interests, we have desires, we have things that we like, that we enjoy, and that which is against that which we want. If, if there's something out there that deprives us of something that we believe brings us pleasure, then we will oppose it naturally. So it definitely will make a difference if someone believes in God and understands the meaning of life, whether he can go along with what I'm going to say, whether it will make any sense to him. I want to make it clear that my whole intention in talking about this topic is pure. It is out of love and concern to all of those that may need help in this particular area. It is a very relevant topic and all that I have to say comes from sensitivity and some understanding of what this is all about. So, have you guessed what this is about? It has to do with deviant sexual behavior, with an emphasis or a greater focus on homosexuality. A lot of people have many opinions about this and about other topics as well. The human being is very good at giving opinions and sharing his personal ideas. But do they really matter? Not always can the human being really distinguish between right and wrong, between what is morally correct or not. As we've said before, he's only human and he may not see things very objectively, and especially if it concerns his own personal interest, then he's biased. So he's not always capable, regardless of how smart he is, to be able to distinguish between what is proper and what is not proper, what should be acceptable and what not. Even though we did say that human beings, as a result of the neshama, of the soul that they have in them, they know certain basics. Certain basics, yes. But when there's a conflict with what they want, with what they feel, it becomes more difficult. It becomes a little bit blurry. And we don't really know, always with certainty, what is correct and what is not, unless there's a divine law, unless God told us. Otherwise, there's so many opinions about everything. In the past 150 years, it is obvious that man has moved away from religion. Man has moved away from certain traditional values. And this can be seen in many countries in the world, especially in Western society. For those of you who are familiar with Freud and that kind of thinking, you will notice, I mean, it is quite obvious, you will notice from his approach in trying to figure out human behavior, that he's against traditional restraints. 
what was once upon a time understood as being taboo, being something which is not right, is becoming more and more the norm, more and more acceptable. His way of analysis, and by the way, he was Jewish, his way of analyzing human behavior is that a lot of the guilt that accompanies a transgression committed by man is really due to neurosis. In other words, people have a certain feeling of guilt, something that plagues them, that bothers them consciously. And it's a problem that human beings have, he says. It has nothing to do with religion, per se, he says. It's neurosis. Something like, like a disease, a mental disorder. You know, it shouldn't be there. And what has happened as a result of his way of looking at human behavior and other philosophies as well, that deviance in sensuality or passion is already being called today an alternative lifestyle. It's becoming no longer a problem. It's no longer an illness. How, you know, this is how some people wanted to call it. It is no longer deviant. It's an alternative lifestyle. What about morality? They consider this morally legitimate and socially acceptable. In other words, they don't see anything wrong with it today. What does the Torah have to say about this? And when I say Torah, I also include the other monotheistic religions, which are, for the most part, based on similar Torah values, concerning certain areas, that is, of life. And pretty much, they see this as an abomination. What is an abomination? Abomination means that this is repulsive. This is aberrant behavior. This is not the norm. This is not natural. Why is it not natural? Because you can tell men and women were designed, designed to reproduce. Can't you see? So this is the basic explanation given. But this really is so insufficient to help alleviate the, the problem that some people are really having. There are individuals who are struggling with it. There are individuals who feel uncomfortable about it. There are, there are various levels and shades of homosexuality. And I'm not going to go into all the details of it. It's not necessary because what really what we want to talk about is what's the right approach. Even though I will cover a little bit where it comes from. But it's not important that we focus too much on why it happens. It's more important that we deal with how to go about it properly and realize that it is correctable. It's not something that you're stuck with, even though it's difficult. It is possible to correct. And I intentionally use the word correct and not to cure, because it's not an illness. I want to make that clear that even though some people feel that this is an illness, it's not. It's actually quite natural. It doesn't mean that it's correct, it doesn't mean that it's right, but it's quite natural. So even though we just said that the Torah is very emphatic and very clear, that this is wrong, does it tell us why it's wrong? Or is it just that people are designed differently? There is a hidden message in the word abomination, in the Hebrew word abomination. The Hebrew word is to'eva. And the rabbis tell us the message in that word is to'eva. That the human being can be mistaken, can be misguided to believe that it, this is another form of connection, of a deep, intimate connection that for a man to be intimately connected to another man may be acceptable. After all, he has feelings. He's attracted. He has deep feelings. He cares about this other individual. 
then why can it that why can it be physical? Why can it be intimate the same way a man and a woman are intimate? So the rabbis tell us the message here is forget about abomination right now. Toe ba. This is the key. If we want to properly understand the subject, the key is the word toe ba, which means it's a mistake. One is being misguided here. Something is causing him to not have clarity here. He's being misguided. There's some mistake in the way he sees this whole relationship. Okay, but isn't there love? Doesn't love conquer all? Love is something very powerful. It really is. But do we understand what love is? If somebody says, but I love him. Well, why don't you marry your mother if you love her? Don't you love your mother? Then why don't you marry your mother? So love does not really tell us too much. Because if, if this is all about love, then why have laws forbidding incest or adultery? Somebody is in love with his neighbor's wife or brothers and sisters. Incest. If it's all about love, then why have laws prohibiting certain relationships? I mean, after all, there are some laws in the book, which I think the majority of people agree with. They may not agree on this, but they will agree that incest, no. Adultery, well, you know, that's also controversial. Some people are, would like perhaps to see adultery legalized as well. After all, we're talking about a liberal society. We live in a very liberal society, and adultery is not so much of a problem to many people as it was in the past. Well, go ahead and demonstrate for legalizing incest and, abo and adultery. What about selfless love? You know, some people really, really want to show their love openly, and they feel that the only way they can do that and feel fulfilled is if, if you allow them polygamy. You know what polygamy is, right? Not one wife, many wives. They really have so much love to give. I hope that they also have enough credit cards for each one of them. <laughs> it can become expensive. But why not? Somehow, society understands that polygamy, except for certain parts of the world, is really not not right. Then there's something called pedestry, which was very common in the past and still is to some extent in some country where an adult has a boy. He's married. He does have a marriage relationship with a woman, but he also has a boy for, her, for pleasure. He loves the boy too. He buys him gifts and the boy maybe likes it too. That's called pedestry. It was, it was a common practice in the, in the past amongst the Greeks, the Romans, various parts of the world. And many, many uh, peoples or cultures didn't see a problem with it. Some actually saw it as something healthy and good for the boy. Did you ever think about the harm that this may be causing him? How could somebody see if there's any harm if all he's focused on is what good can he derive from this? When people want to derive pleasure, they don't always analyze the consequences of their action. They don't analyze it thoroughly. Perhaps this is good for you, that's what you claim, but perhaps this is damaging to the boy. And this has to do with a bigger problem, is that not all human beings see what is best for the world, for God's world but what is best for them. And since that's the way many people focus on what brings them pleasure, and what benefits them, they don't see the bigger picture. But wait a minute, isn't that repressive? This is a repressive law to not allow two men to decide on their own if the two are consenting after all. They're adults. Isn't that repressive if we made a law? For those who make that claim, 
they seem to forget that all laws are repressive. We need laws, and laws limit. They can't be repressive. And if you legalize just about every one of these things that are forbidden, at least at this time, what's going to be left that is sinful? What's going to be left that is immoral? Sooner or later, they're going to legalize everything. So in other words, there's nothing sinful, nothing that's immoral. Comes along the Torah. Torah is very well aware of human nature. And human nature is such that we all have certain immoral proclivities, as it's called in fancy English. For those who don't understand the word proclivity, a certain inclination. A certain inclination to do that which we have an impulse to do it. We didn't think too much about it, but there's an impulse there. There's an instinct there. And deep down, it could be wrong, but we have an impulse to do it anyway. And the Torah recognizes that these impulses exist. And it gave us mitzvot, commandments, to change those impulses. How? By channeling, channeling them properly, by sanctifying them, by elevating them. And that is why you will find that in the Torah, there's an emphasis of Kedoshim to you, which is this week's parasha, the portion that we read, be holy. Holy? What's that? <laughs> because part of us is animal. And we do have certain proclivities that are more animalistic. That's OK. I'm going to explain why we have them soon. But there's a way to deal with them, elevate them, channel them properly, be holy. By fulfilling the commandments, you will become holy. The mitzvot are therefore very important because they enable us to control ourselves. I want to make it clear that even though an intimate relationship between a man and another man, or a woman and another woman, seems to be unacceptable, and the Torah says very clearly that this is an abomination, it is still possible for a man to have an altruistic or platonic relationship with another man. That is pure, deep love, without intimacy. You really care about someone? The Torah says, Love your fellow as much as you love yourself. Now, what does that mean? Could I really love somebody like I love myself? No. What it really means is, whatever you don't want him to do to you, don't do unto him. In other words, care about him. Be as concerned about his welfare as you are about yours. You would want people to visit you if you're sick. Visit him if he's sick. If he's in need, help him. Just like you would want people to help you. Then be that way with others. Love. Love another human being. Form a very deep bond with another human being. Besides one's wife, husband and wife, that is an, another idea. The rabbis tell us in the ethics of our fathers in Pikevot, acquire a friend where you can be close to, where you can share your thoughts with, your private thoughts with. A good friend, a close friend, will tell you off, will rebuke you if you are wrong. And there's a chance that you may listen to him faster than you will listen to a thousand speeches of a rabbi who doesn't know you on that personal level, who's not as close to you. So developing a very strong, healthy bond with a friend is actually healthy. It's actually good. It's advisable, but not physical. Physical, to'eba. You're making a mistake if you're taking this to the level of physicality, to intimacy. People forget that expressions of love don't have to be physical. If you love someone, you'll write them a beautiful birthday card. 
you, you can do so much for another person to show your love for them. It doesn't have to be physical. So where does the problem begin? The problem begins with the complexities of man's sexuality. This sexuality, if it's not tamed properly, can lead to something called zoophilia or bestiality, which the Torah speaks about too. Be careful not to copy and not to do what your neighbors, in other words, what the other cultures and civilizations around you have done, the Torah speaking to the Jewish people. And what's that? Well, there's all kinds of practices that they were engaged in that is so impure, that is so wrong, that is so destructive. One of them is bestiality. It was being physical with animals. And you say, what? Is this really happening today? It's happening today too. Especially in areas where people live in close proximity to animals. All over the world. This has always been the case. Not so many, but it exists. So if this sexuality is not tamed properly, it could lead to that. Now, if the Torah would think that the human being is safe, you know, there was most human beings, eh, they won't even think of it, they won't even attempt it, then it wouldn't forbid it. If the Torah is forbidding something, it's because it recognizes that every human being is capable of succumbing to this. Otherwise, why forbid something? Who thinks about this? Who even wants this? Human nature is usually, I mean, if it's well directed, properly directed, is to want, hopefully, the proper things, the normal things. Yes, usually, but not always. We all have certain inclinations. And some of those inclinations are not always right. And they could be sometimes aberrant, deviant. And sometimes they can even be extreme, like bestiality. So the Torah has to forbid this because the human being, regardless of his background and his religion, his beliefs and faith, is capable of doing something like that. Then there is the topic of zera levatala, throwing away one's seed, which is a whole topic in itself, which I don't uh, think we have the time to cover it. It's a very big topic. But part of this problem of physical, intimate relationship between two men is that the seed of life is being thrown away, which the Kabbalah goes more into it. It's very serious. It's a very serious offense. But this is a, a side issue, but not to be minimized. We need to clarify that homosexuality it's not an illness. And I, I say we need to clarify because in order to properly understand this, we have to go back and read a little bit about how the creation of man came to be. And when we dissect the words of the Torah in describing Adam and Chava, the first human beings, and how they became one, we will understand that intimacy is much more than just about physical love. Intimacy ultimately has a goal. And the goal, one of the goals, is procreation. So it is important to immediately <laughs> exclude anybody who has this bearing behavior as though he has some sort of illness, because it's not so. As we said before, it has more to do with a mistake, a mistaken approach to this area called intimacy. The mistake lies in misunderstanding the human being and what he was created for. So let's go back in time to Bereshit, to the book of Genesis. And we find in reading the Torah that man has two inclinations. These two inclinations, Yetzer Ara and Yetzer Atov, are important driving forces 
in the human biology, and in the neshama, in the soul. The yetzer atov, the positive impulse, is the drive or the driving force that encourages or motivates us to do what is right and what is positive. The yetzer ara is the bad inclination, the inclination that drives us to that which is more physical. I didn't use the word or the description evil inclination because as you will soon see, it's not evil. It's bad. Why is it bad? Because it's contrary to the other one. It opposes the other one. It is very different than the other one. One relates to the soul and one relates to the body. Throughout history, it has become, it's, it's quite obvious if you read the history books, that human beings had inclinations towards women and towards men. This is not something new. And there are some who had inclinations to the two of them. So, was it always an illness? <laughs> no. The inclinations were always there. The question is, but where is this inclination coming from? That's the big question. Is it from the good inclination or from the bad inclination? It's not an illness. It's an inclination, but we need to know where it's coming from. You remember the story with Adam and Chavad that they ate from the tree that they were not supposed to eat, from the fruit? Now you understand why I'm calling this forbidden fruits? This was Etz Hadat, the tree of knowledge. All they were supposed to do is just keep this one commandment. Don't eat from the forbidden fruit. What happens? They ate it. They went against God's will, and they ate from the forbidden fruit. Then what happened? All of a sudden, they felt somewhat guilty, ashamed. They realized that they were naked. What do you mean? They just realized now? Didn't they know that before? They just realized something that they didn't know before? Yes, before they ate from the tree of knowledge, they were so pure. Their, pure, their purity was such that to be able to tell wrong from right was almost automatic. They didn't have to think too much about it. They were so pure. Now that they've eaten from the etzadat, in order for them to be able to know right from wrong is much more difficult. Now they have to struggle with figuring things out because what they have just caused through their action, through their free will, was a mixture of these two inclinations, the inclination of good and the inclination of bad. Before that, those two inclinations were apart, like east from west. It was not difficult to know the difference between the two of them. All of a sudden, they realized that they were naked. All of a sudden, they realized, wait a minute, we're half animal, which, by the way, explains why they were capable of rebelling against God's wishes. How could you do that? Don't you know God? You seek, I mean, you hear Him? They realized that they were naked, meaning that they realized that they, half of them is animal. They were ashamed of themselves. Before that, they were so pure. To them, it was so clear where they come from, that they are divine. And now to make matters worse, through eating that forbidden fruit that from the tree of knowledge, they've caused a short circuit, if you want to call it that, by touching two wires, by taking the good inclination and the bad inclination and mixing it. By going against God's wishes, they bungled things up. They messed up. And now, because the two, the evil inclination or the bad inclination and the good inclination are all mixed up, 
it is so much more difficult to know right from wrong. What we think is so good and so nice and proper and acceptable, maybe it's wrong, maybe it is really forbidden. Our perception right now is off. We don't have the same clarity. We have been stripped of that purity. We have been left bare, naked. And the animal within us is quite powerful, many times dominant, instead of the purity of the soul controlling and guiding our life. It has therefore become more difficult to tell right from wrong. But this bad inclination, is it really bad? No. Because when God says after He created the world, Kitov, this is good. After everything He made, this is good. He meant even the bad inclination is good. Why? Because we need it. We need to eat. We need to procreate. We need that which is physical. We, we are human beings. We are a soul in a physical body. The physical body has wants, has desires. And those desires are necessary. If you would not eat, you die from hunger. So we have those instincts there in place in order to assure our survival. But it is important to be able to differentiate between the two. Even though we, we have those needs, and those needs are definitely in order to assure our survival, we must recognize the difference between the needs of the body and the needs of the soul and not confuse the two. Many mistakes in life happen as a result of mixing the two. What some people perceive as good may really be bad, and what some people perceive as bad may not be so bad after all. We need to have clarity as to what is acceptable and what is not. Where is it coming from? What helps us with that are the mitzvot. The mitzvot that we receive in the Torah help us be able to figure out, wait a minute, this impulse, this drive, this interest that I have, where is it coming from? From this camp or from that camp? Is a friend or foe? We don't always know. The mitzvot help us in be able to sort these things out. In order to better understand, however, intimacy, we need to go back to Adam and Chava, where it says that when they were intimate, the verb vayeda Adam et ishto is used. Vayeta means, and he knew her. Vayeta, that sounds familiar. Vayeta, to know. We just spoke about the etza da'at. Da'at is knowledge. Vayeta means to know. Hmm, I wonder if there's any connection between knowing her and that knowledge, the tree of knowledge. It's the same word, da'at. And the Kabbalah explains, yes, there definitely is a connection because da'at is the highest form of knowledge. You have chokhmah, bina, vadat. Chokhmah is wisdom. It's just plain raw knowledge. Bina is understanding. That is the highest form of knowledge because it's internalized. It's that which we've studied, that which we've learned, that we have adapted. We've internalized it. We've made it part of ourselves. We have implemented it in our life. So when Adam knew his wife, what does it mean he knew? They became one. The whole idea of intimacy between a man and a woman is to become one. To love each other, to be one, to stay together, and to become one with Hashem, with God. Why? Because the idea behind this unison, behind this coming together of the man and woman is to produce new life. It's not just for company. It's not just because you need a cook and somebody to wash your dishes and do your laundry. To become one for a man and a woman is to become one with God, because God is a partner. 
in enabling new life to emerge so the human species can continue. So Vayeda Adam et Ishto, he knew her, he became one with her. And if you become one with your partner for the real reasons, you're becoming one with God. And what is the real reason? To bring about new life. Obviously, when husband and wife get married, they are also there for each other emotionally. Kabbalah explains that the male gives and the female receives. So there is a need here for a physical interaction, not only in producing a child, but in the act of giving and receiving. That's the act of kindness. Rabbis tell us, Olam Chesed Yibaneh, the whole world stands on kindness the act of kindness. Where does kindness begin? You remember the famous saying, charity begins at home? Well, there are many people who are kind to others outside of their home, but in their home they're not so kind to their partner. True kindness begins at home, where a husband gives to his wife, and the wife gives to the husband, of course. They're, they're intended to both give to each other, to complement each other. They both need each other. Man cannot be on his own. Man cannot be by himself. But it's not only about procreation, it is about an exchange of roles, perhaps you can say, or, or, or perhaps exchange is not a right word, but the sharing of, of roles in a home where the man is in charge of certain things, the woman is in charge of other things, and as a unit, the two are able to grow together and become one. But what we see here is the concept of giving and receiving. Whereas the male is the one that gives and the female is the one that receives. So physically, there is a need for giving and receiving, the gift of life. That's the way it happens. So even though we said before, you can have a loving relationship without physical connection, with a man and a woman, you need a physical connection because of the giving and receiving of the human life. But emotionally, in caring about each other, you don't need physicality for that. that but that needs to be there as well. That needs to exist. The man and woman connection is about many, many things. It's not just about physical connection. But now we need to talk a little bit more about the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah gets a little bit deeper into what really is going on between the husband and wife when they're having a child. Knowledge, we said, is something internal. It's something that you connect to, something that becomes a part of you. Well, one's thoughts are a part of us too, the machshavot. One of the reasons that the intimate act in Hebrew, in Biblical Hebrew at least, is called Yediyah, is because the father and mother transmit through their thoughts a certain influence to the child. Through their behavior, through their thoughts, if they're pure or not pure, somehow they transmit something to the child that is, is about to be born and how he ends up being and how he ends up behaving has a little bit to do with what went on during the time that the husband and wife were together. The human being, as we said before, has free will. And it is through his will, through his free will, that he sometimes makes mistakes and that he confuses or he messes up or he mixes up between right and wrong. And since he mixes up between right and wrong, he causes tremendous amount of damage that he's sometimes not even aware of. Having wrong thoughts, having an impure thought, we may think as something that is so trivial, something that doesn't do any damage, but it does. 
how can my thoughts do damage? I didn't act upon them. <laughs> but when a child is being formed, when a child is, is developing in the mother's womb, yes, even her cravings, they say, can affect the child. Right? You've heard about the cravings a mother has? So when a father and mother have certain thoughts, and those thoughts are not pure while they are intimate, they can do damage. Damage to the inclination of that child when he's born. And the damage will be in the form of a more intense or stronger inclination to that which is impure, if those thoughts were impure. Whereas if the thoughts are pure, then they're giving, they're endowing that child with a soul that will have, hopefully, a stronger inclination to do what is right. Okay, so now we've come to the point of where man, from the very beginning, has made a big mistake. And that mistake has caused the bad and the good to mix. Now what? What are we going to do now? How are we going to fix that? The Jewish people were chosen to rectify this. This is pretty much our mission. The mission is a lot broader than what I just said, but part of that mission involves rectifying the original Chet Adam Arishon, the original sin, the primordial sin. How are we going to rectify this terrible mixture that abounds in the world? Through the mitzvot, Hashem says, don't worry, I'll help you. I'm going to give you a map. I'm going to give you the guide. I'm going to give you a manual of instructions. And you'll figure out how to repair. Just follow. How many people today, when they buy an appliance, read the manual of instructions? They just try to figure it out on their own. They're pressing buttons, and they hope it will work. Life is complex. We want to succeed. We want to do the right things. Hopefully, the creator of life would have given us a manual of instructions. Otherwise, how does he expect us to figure things out on our own? So our conscience does tell us some things. But sometimes it becomes difficult to figure out, we said before, because good and bad are mixed. Things are not so clear. They're blurry. Hashem tells the Jewish people, you want this job? 613 commandments, 613 instructions. But if you follow them, you will be able to make order here. You will be able to separate right from wrong, good and bad. And that which is bad, hopefully you will learn how to elevate it and sanctify it and channel it properly. How do you do that? When you eat, eat to be healthy so that you can serve God, so that you can live, live a normal, purposeful life. Don't eat just because you want to indulge yourself that's not eating for the right reasons. You can take that which is physical and elevate it, and make it holy, channel it properly. How? Follow the mitzvot. The mitzvot will guide you. They will teach you right from wrong. Take the physical relationship between husband and wife, intimacy. Yes, people want it, yes, but do it for the right reasons and you will elevate it. Have the right thoughts and your children will be pure as well. Oh, we never heard about this. <laughs> you see what I mean? Unfortunately, there's so many ideas here that are just not known. Not known. And it is a shame. There's so much that we can gain from realizing that we, as human beings, have impulses that are completely natural. It's not an illness. But it's perhaps misguided. Perhaps we're mistaken in our approach on how to use a certain impulse. Perhaps we're confused. On the one hand, we know something is wrong. On the other hand, we, we desire it. But just because you desire it and you feel so strongly about it doesn't mean it's right. But if you do not believe in a God, obviously, it makes it more difficult because you don't want to be deprived of anything. You want ice cream, and if you can afford it, you're going to buy it. Even if they tell you it's unhealthy, well, 
some people's attitude, you only live once, you might as well enjoy it. Really? Is that what it's all about? It's about enjoying it? And do you really only live once? <laughs> so you see how people's attitude, the way of thinking, is really influenced by their wants and desires, not by the truth. Not by what, if something is right or wrong. The Kabbalah continues to explain something fascinating. That man has tremendous ability to influence even the animal world through his actions. We just said that through one's thoughts, he's capable of influencing the, his child to a certain extent. He can influence the animal world. How? Remember the story of the Mabul of the flood? What does it say of there? That God was upset at man? Kishhit kol basar darko. That every human being, or any, any, any creature actually, of flesh, corrupted their way. That's what it says. Ishchit kol basar. It doesn't say kol adam, every human being. Every creature of flesh. It means the animals. The animals corrupted their way. So the rabbis tell us, yes, as a result of the human beings corrupting their way through promiscuity, through abnormal relationships, through all kinds of, of prohibited relationships, it caused even the animals to corrupt their ways and crossbred. Animals don't naturally crossbreed. They don't think about going with some, not some other species. If you see that, and you may see that today too, occasionally, it is indicative that man has corrupted his ways. It is through man's behavior that he may increase the, the amount of impurity in the world and give it more power. And when that impurity pervades, it, it affects everything. The whole atmosphere is affected. Even animals pervert or corrupt their ways. That is how powerful our thoughts and behavior is, not only in influencing ourselves and our children, but even the animals. But now we need to talk a little bit about love. After all, people want to love. They want to have a loving relationship. And love is something very powerful. It involves a tremendous amount of emotions, sentiments, feelings. And we want to be very loving to certain people. Why can't we be loving to those of the same sex? So what did we say before? You can. Not in the physical way. In an altruistic, platonic way. But that's not enough. Some people will feel that for love to be complete, it has to be physical too. What do you tell them? The only way to properly deal with this is to understand that even though love is something so special and powerful, there's two kinds of love. There's a love that comes from holiness, and there's a love that can come from impurity. There's two types of love. And when we think of love, we say, okay, love is, is beautiful. It is. It can be very beautiful, and it definitely is more complete, perhaps, if it's physical, maybe. Right? But what did we say before along? It is easily to make a mistake in thinking that something is love when in fact it is, but it's not coming from holiness, it's coming from impurity. What is a love that comes from impurity? It's called passion. It's intense, it's powerful. There's a tremendous attraction between the two. Man and man, too. Powerful, real. But is that love? How many people have gotten divorced 
after the most powerful passion that you can imagine between them. Passion is not love. Passion is, if anything, fake. <laughs> it's not completely fake. You know, it's important to have passion in your relationship, husband and wife. But it's secondary. I say fake because it's misleading. As Solomon says, Sheker achem vehevela yofi. Chen. Grace. Sheker. It could be misleading you. Yofi beauty is vain. Are you going to marry somebody just for, because of her beauty or because of her grace? That's superficial. Look deeper into the person, her qualities. That's more important, right? Some people don't know that, don't realize that until it's too late. What's really important in a relationship? That they do really care about each other. And if it's physical that is bringing them together, then that could be coming from the Tum'ah, not from the Kedusha. If, it's, if the physicality is so important, that could be coming from an impure source, not from holiness. Because holiness does not necessarily emphasize the physicality. Not that you don't need it. You need it between a husband and wife. There needs to be good chemistry and a physical connection. But that's not the more important one. So if the physicality is being emphasized so much that perhaps it's coming from the Koha from the power, impure forces, the impure camp, the holy camp will not allow for something like that to happen between a man and another man because it's misguided. Altruistic? Platonic? Yes. It could be a very strong relationship. David and Yonatan, the best example. They had a beautiful relationship. And some want to say that it was one of those kinds of relationships that should not happen. You know, it was an unnatural relationship. It's not true. It was a completely natural relationship where the two of them invested in each other. If two men invest and make an effort and care about each other, they can have a lasting relationship, an enduring relationship. Altruism. That's what it's all about, is to really care for another human being, even if he's many years younger than you. It makes no difference. People can have a beautiful relationship that is not physical. And that is why when people have a tremendous physical attraction, it could lead them easily to prostitution. Because it's a desire, it's a natural desire, natural instinct that is there, but it's being misguided and it's not being used properly. That power, that physical power that is there, that needs to be there. But why are you using it there? Get married. Have a loving relationship with the right person. Don't misuse that power, that God-given power, that God-given natural instinct, in a wrong way, in an unholy way. But it's love. Yes, it's a kind of love too, but you're loving more yourself. It's a love that you have for yourself to satisfy a need. It's not a love of wanting to give to someone because a love of wanting to give to someone is a spiritual love. It's a holy, pure love. It's a love that does not need the physical. But with the wife, it's physical. Yeah, with the wife, it needs to be physical because it's intended to bring new life into the world. So, I mean, there, that has to be physical too. But if there was no need for procreation, then it wouldn't have to need, we wouldn't have to have a physical connection. We would just have giving to each other and helping each other and caring for each other. Because that's what love is. According to Judaism, real love is to give, is the act of giving. And obviously, to give, you have to have somebody to receive. So it could be a man, it could be a woman. But physical is intended for a woman because it's intended to procreate. All right, now we just need to explain why certain individuals really have a very strong inclination, nonetheless, towards the same sex. Where does this come from? And this is one of the biggest debates of all. There's all kinds of opinions about this. Where does it come from? We said before it has nothing to do with illness. So I'm just going to briefly cover what our sources have to say about this. The first, you already know by now. 
sometimes it could be a child or an adult behave in a certain way as a result of their parents not having had clean, pure thoughts at the time that the child was conceived. That may have something to do with the child's behavior. We said it affects him. It could also be that a human being has certain tendencies or inclinations as a result of her previous reincarnation. And this is something that he needs to struggle with, to rectify. It could be circumstances, all kinds of circumstances, psychological, as well as all kinds of abuse that even the experts agree may have affected the child's preference. So there are, kinds of, there are all kinds of circumstances that can also contribute, and he's not necessarily born this way. He could have developed it with time. That's a possibility. But it could be that early on it's already there because of some impure thoughts on the parent's side. And now I want to give you, I want to share with you something that a lot of people are unaware of. And that is astrology has something to do with it too. This may come as a surprise, not to astrologers necessarily. Those who have studied astrology, I think, will understand a little bit the, the truth behind this. Depending on one's mazal, depending on one's astrological makeup. When I say makeup, I mean the combination of factors in his astrological map. Certain inclinations are more intense than others. Imagine a whole bunch of knobs to raise or adjust the volume on a, uh, on a loudspeaker, you know, on these uh, musical instruments where you have all kinds of knobs to adjust, to balance the, the various uh, bass and treble and other effects that you want to put into the music. Astrology is, is a system where some people are born with certain knobs or certain areas in their character more intense or more elevated than others. That is why you will find that certain individuals have a tendency to steal more than others, to lie. You know people who like to lie? It's just, it's just a fact of life. Uh, or are more promiscuous. Promiscuity is definitely a Unfortunately, it's a phenomenon that's, that exists. Some people have more of a, of a craving for that. Some people are more lazy. Some people love to eat. Some people are stingy, miserly. They don't even spend on themselves. Then you have the opposite. People who are so giving and so generous. People who are so quick and totally not lazy. Then you have those who get angry, those who are calm. Imagine knobs. One is higher, one is lower. And sometimes, as a result of certain combinations, certain children are more effeminate than others. And this is just something that they need to deal with. What all of these have in common regardless of the cause, which is not that important, really. What they all have in common, which is what we really need to focus on, they are all a nisayon. They're all a challenge. Judaism views hardships of all kind, all kind, and this is one of them, as a challenge. We're given free will to make choices. And we can choose whether we succumb to them we go with the flow, or we conquer them and control them and elevate them and sanctify them. That's up to us. But the fact that they're there is something that we can't run away from. They can be there for all kinds of reasons, many perhaps that we don't even know. I just gave you a few. Maybe there's even more. There's other reasons. 
But let's not forget, it is a challenge. What about those whose mazal is to be poor? Financially, they're having a difficult time, they're struggling. What about those whose partner is not a rational person? They're married to them. Should, you, should they just divorce them, or should they try to help them? It's a challenge. We all have challenges. The fact that right and wrong, good and bad, are all mixed today is the biggest challenge of mankind. But if you read the manual of instructions, you have a better chance of being able to sort things out, of figuring out what to do and what not to do. What are, what are we supposed to do? Or what should add, add, our attitude be and our approach to those individuals who nonetheless have this problem? Is a lot of empathy, a lot of patience, understanding, and sensitivity, and of course the willingness to help if they choose to be helped. We have to be there for them, not look down at them. And finally, for those who really want to do the right thing, we must not forget that we are created in the image of God. So we are supposed to ask, what does God want of me? What God wants of me is to connect with Him. Because the greatest and the most powerful connection is the connection with God. And that is accomplished by fulfilling His mitzvot, His commandment. I assure you that if we focus on this relationship with God, we will realize at some point in our life that this is the most beautiful sensation of all. The most powerful and the most beautiful connection that exists. The connection between us and our children is beautiful. The connection between us and our parents is wonderful. The connection between friends, husband and wife is superb. But the greatest connection of all, which we should focus and aspire to get to, is having a strong connection with God. Thank you. Thank you.